hard we can begin. So if you're ready, let us do so. I'm sure some people will keep coming in. If it's in person, we'd be trying to figure out if people are getting parked or getting into the store or what, whatnot. Now it's still getting to the computer and getting in. But to everyone who is joining us from the various places, and we are seeing some places um, coming in here, um, welcome and thank you so much for being with us. Um, my colleague Karen and everyone else at the Elliott Bay Book Company, which is on Duwamish land in the city of Seattle in the Northwestern part of the United States are glad you're here. We are tonight um, very honored to have Stephen Mills with us um, to talk about, to read from and talk about his extraordinary book, Chosen, uh, a memoir of stolen boyhood, a book um, that he has written um, at a certain point of life to talk about things that befell him as a boy, um, very much the subtitle of Stolen Boyhood, um, is what this book is about, um, his um, experience of being sexually abused by a camp counselor as, when he was a adolescent and, um, and the long, long time that it's taken to understand, comprehend, heal and reckon with it all. And it's, it's a book um, and a story that unfortunately has, has many others who I think um, will recognize themselves and, their, and things that have happened to them um, boys, girls, others um, who've been through versions of this. This is something um, we were talking a little beforehand about some books that came out decades ago, but even having language to talk about these things um, in various ways is something that, you know, it really has come along only the last few years. And then to be able to do so um, in the language and to talk about what it all means and read what it means and is saying um, and, and take it in through the various ways we take anything in, um, but certainly of this kind of magnitude is um, something to um, again, reckon with. And this Stephen has done in this book, he's gonna read from and talk about this and he'll do so um, with someone who knows this area of what's happened for, for the people who've suffered it and survived it. And in and, and the whole context of these things happening and having Noreen Roberts, who's here in Seattle, and uh, let me set this up a little more, Stephen's down, you didn't hear him, he's in Venice um, Beach down in Los Angeles. Noreen is here in Seattle and she um, joins us as the um, team facilitator for the uh, Children's Justice Center of King County. Work she's doing and has done um, that uh, comes from her own um, many years of work in uh, working with children who are um, surviving sexual abuse. She's done this um, also with as a program manager, Catherine Booth, Booth House, and um, also at the Department of Children, Youth and Families um, for the state um, and others. She's been doing, anyway, she's, she and Stephen have done some other programs and some other talks together. So you're, you're getting also two people who've been having this conversation. Um, we, we, yeah, this book, I think, and Karen was putting also information in the chat about the book itself, where you, we have it, um, you can come get it. And um, I think we have signed book plates too for, for from Stephen yeah. for it. Um, but this is such a vital and extraordinary and necessary book. And we're honored that Stephen is um, doing this with us and along with Noreen. Um, if you have questions and in, in, in the chat, you could please put them in the chat and after Stephen reads, he and Noreen will be conversing, and then Noreen will work those questions um, into the into the conversation. And I am about to disappear from the scene here. We'll reappear at the end. Um, but we thank you all again and ask you now, please join in giving good virtual attention and applause and care and consideration to Stephen Mills, to Chosen, a memoir of stolen boyhood, and Noreen Roberts. Thank you. Stephen and Noreen, thank you both. Thanks so much, Rick. I did want to, um, well, first of all, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I wanted to uh, correct one small thing that Rick said. I was actually sexually abused by the director of the camp, not a counselor, um, which is significant for several reasons uh, that we'll talk about. But um, Noreen, did you have anything you want to uh, say at the top? or? No, I think uh, take okay. it away with uh, a, a reading and we'll-, okay. we'll Yeah, so I thought I'd, I thought I'd read something from the book just because it sets up um, lots of different issues uh, about uh, sexual abuse and 
uh, the experience and institutional complicity and all sorts of things. But let me just, um, the scene is from part two uh, of the book, uh, 1978, I was 23 years old and I had actually gone to work uh, for Dan Farinella directing Camp Henry Horner in Illinois, the same person who had sexually abused me uh, starting when I was 13. And, you know, as an adult, or most adults look at that and say, whoa, that's kind of crazy. How could you go to work for the guy who had sexually abused you? But in fact, uh, this is quite common. Uh, my uh, way of processing or not processing as a teenager, the abuse, and I was actually not processing, it was so overwhelming and I was so dissociated. I had no language for it. And so, um, you know, what the body does to protect you uh, from that kind of trauma is not to share it with the conscious mind. And so I just, I was in survival mode uh, and uh, I just plowed forward later, much later, um, maybe around 30, I came to understand that what I had was Stockholm syndrome. I mean, this guy had taken me hostage, uh, physically hostage, emotionally hostage at age 13. And I was, it felt like my survival depended on him. And so eight years later, age 23, I went to work for him, uh, as did several other victims, by the way, who followed him from camp to camp. Um, there's a pivotal scene in part two where I'm there at Camp Henry Horner and it's late in the summer. And I see Dan, the director, going into a cabin uh, with a boy of 12 or 13 who looked exactly like me at that age. And prior to that moment, it had never occurred to me that there had been other boys, other victims. I didn't even think of it as victims at that point. I didn't know what had happened to me. And, um, but the second I saw him go into the cabin with that boy who he towered over, I understood in a flash what had happened to me, that I wasn't the only one, and that he was going to do to this boy what he had done to me. It was just this really lightning bolt of a minute, of a, of a moment that happened, just like a mirror of my own experience. And um, my first response when they went inside was absolute terror because whatever it was that had allowed me to survive as a teenager, by compartmentalizing uh, my experience and not having to deal with it, that suddenly dissolved and I was face to face with what had happened to me. And I wanted a bolt. My impulse was to pack my bags and get out instantly. But that night, I was up all night thinking about it and feeling it and dealing with it. And, and I realized that leaving was the wrong thing to do because there were kids being harmed. And I made up my mind that I was gonna stay and try to figure out what he was up to and who he was abusing. So that's the setup for this scene. The only other thing you need to know is that Camp LFOs, which is mentioned here, is the camp where I had been abused at age 13 in 1968. And this is, this is what happens the next morning after I'd seen him. I tried to think like a detective. If Dan had been spending time with certain boys, then someone at camp would have noticed the same way the kitchen crew at Camp LFOs had registered how much time he spent with me. I could start with the kitchen boys at Camp Henry Horner, but I didn't know them very well. The counselors might be helpful, but most of them seemed to worship Dan. If I approached them, they might tip him off. What I needed were longtime staff who were independent thinkers, not lackeys. I could only think of two, Ray and Vinny. Ray ran the waterfront. Vinny was the maintenance man. 
Talking to them would be risky. What if they went right to Dan and told him I was asking questions? I'd have to take that chance. After lunch, I went down to the boathouse. Ray and Vinny were sitting outside on the ramp. Ray sported a Mohawk haircut, a Fu Manchu mustache, and his usual blue Speedos. Vinny was bare light, with tightly curled hair, a fat mustache, and a flavor saver beard. They were the Cheech and Chong of Henry Horner, good at their jobs, but just as good at chilling. I joined them on the ramp. My throat felt tight, my hands clammy. I considered aborting the mission. Hey, Steve, what's up? Vinny asked. I want to talk to you guys about something, but I'm not sure how to ask this. That's cool, Ray said. Just ask. Right. Have you ever suspected that Dan is molesting boys in the camp? The second the words left my lips, I wanted to take them back. They sounded batshit crazy. Ray and Vinny exchanged a look, then both nodded. Yes. Why, did you see something, Ray asked? Yeah, I saw Dan go into a cabin with Jake yesterday after lunch. His hideout, Vinny asked. Is that what you guys call it? Yeah, that's where he takes them, Vinny said. I could barely believe what I was hearing. Jake is definitely one of Danny's boys, Ray added. Danny's boys. How long have you known about this? I heard myself ask. Two years, Vinny said. There was a different guy doing maintenance that summer. He thought it was strange how the kitchen boys were with Danny all the time, especially the ones with family problems. Kids started saying stuff to him. They told him that Danny was showing them dirty movies. He talked to me at the end of that summer. I wasn't there that year, Ray interjected. Vinny filled me in when I came back. Two female counselors suspected too. Oh, we were all on to him. Jesus, did you say anything? I asked. No, Ray answered. We didn't have to. He knew we knew. We called it the summer of the sunglasses. He wore these big shades all the time. He would hang out in the animal pen with the shades on, just staring at the animals. It was weird, man. He avoided us all summer. I was so upset about the whole thing, I left camp for two days. I was trying to wrap my head around this, all the people who knew and how routine it was. Did you ever talk about doing anything, you know, to stop him? Yeah, we did, Vinny answered. We thought about going to the cops or the Jewish council but they just say we were a bunch of dope smoking crazies. No doubt, Ray chimed in. No one's gonna believe us over Danny. I wanted to tell them about my own abuse. I hadn't planned on it, but we were in this together now, co-conspirators. He did it to me, I said, at Camp Elifoz in Connecticut. They both gaped at me. Whoa, Vinny said. Jesus Christ, Ray said. I'm willing to talk to anyone if it'll help stop him. When was this, Steve? Ray asked. It ended eight years ago. I was 15. I'm really sorry, man, Ray said, but that's ancient history. I don't think that'll help here. How can you stand it, I asked. Just being around him, knowing what he's doing. It's fucked up, but this is his camp, Vinny said. We just work here. Stephen, I have a couple, there's a lot of questions. Um, a lot of feelings that, that uh, I so remember reading that part of the book. Mm -hmm. But here's um, my first question that that passage brings up for me. So up until that point, the day before you have this conversation with these with these guys, you had thought that you were the only one until you saw this other this other 13 year old kid yeah. go into the cabin. Yeah. And of course, you know, we you, you come to find out that that is so far from the truth. Mm -hmm. Why do you think you were 
why do you think that you thought you were the only one up until that point? Because I had no way, I didn't even understand what had happened to me, much less, in other words, have a concept for something that I could apply to someone else. I just thought from the second it happened when I was 13, I had done something horribly wrong and I was being punished. And if I told anyone, I would be killed. That's what I thought. And that, that terror was what was living in my body. So really, as a teenager, and really up until this moment, 1978, when I was 23, I was, the best way I can describe it is I was trying to disappear. I was trying not to be found out. And it was very claustrophobic. You know, my world got shrunk smaller and smaller and smaller. And I was trying to vanish all the time. Obviously not literally vanish, although that would come later, but I was psychologically trying to make myself as small um, and invisible as possible. And when you're in that mode, the last thing you're going to notice is other people or what might be happening to other people. And even if it was right in my face, because I didn't comprehend what had happened to me, I just don't think there was no chance that I'd um, put two and two together for something else. It was so off the map of my experience and understanding as a teenager that this could happen and what it was. Um, and as I described early on, after the first time he assaulted me, I thought that he had taken me hostage and had some kind of plan for blackmailing me, which is where the fear of getting killed came from. It had nothing to do with sex, nothing to do with sex, quite common uh, with kids because the experience for the adult may be sexual, but for the kid, it's anything but. It is, for me, it was a near-death experience. I was out of my body. So um, I, didn't, I didn't have the wherewithal and know-how to identify other kids. And of course, you know, later in my 20s, uh, which I talk about in the book, when I started tracking down other victims, almost invariably the first line out of their mouths was, Jesus Christ, I thought I was the only one. So, uh, you know, there was this common thread of um, feeling singularly um, abnormal and bad and um, punished. Yeah. By the way, I think it would be, this would be a great moment for you to talk about your work, Noreen, and what you do, because your work with boys and the study of boys, I mean, just briefly, maybe, sure. it, you know, yeah. will like really frame why this is so, man, this is just this issue. And like those things I was just saying are, are today, right now, right here in every community in the country and how boys experience this stuff, because that human nature doesn't change. Yeah, absolutely. So how uh, Stephen and I came to uh, be connected for, for this event and, and some others is, um, so I work in the, the child abuse field here in King County. I am the multidisciplinary team coordinator and facilitator for the Children's Justice Center of King County. It's a mouthful. Uh, we are the uh, accredited child advocacy center here in King County. We're embedded in the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. Um, and my job is to pull together teams of folks who respond to child abuse cases. So detectives, um, DCYF, uh, uh, the medical child abuse folks, our, our advocates, uh, prosecutors, um, CASAs and GALs and schools and all the people who have a role to play, bring them all together um, uh, so that hopefully we are collaborating and communicating as best we can. Um, but what Stephen was just referencing was actually uh, research I did about 10 years ago now for um, an agency called ECPAT, um, the international NGO. I worked in their Brooklyn offices uh, and I served as a lead researcher for their Amboys 2 research, um, which uh, was focused on uh, sex trafficked boys in the US. So 
um, when uh, when Stephen got connected to to the CJCKC um, that I was elected based on uh, <laughs> my past work. Um, but there, there are so many. I'm gonna. I have. A, I have a part in the book. I'm gonna. I'm gonna read it right now on this topic of boys that really sat heavy with me. It's on page 297. This mm -hmm. is when you're talking with Agent Greenlee, and she says it's amazing you got adult victims to sign statements. You don't know how unusual that is, but boys are even tougher. Boys who have been abused are tougher to crack than murderers. You try all the tricks, they just don't break. I can't, I was like, yeah, yes, that's been, <laughs> right. I can't tell you how many times when I was doing that, the research on sex traffic boys that people told me that they don't exist uh, because yeah. they don't come forward. Unbelievable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and for sure. Sorry, we, did you want to? No, no, no. Some... Jump in. Yeah. Well, I can totally relate to that. I mean, you could have put a gun to my head when I was 13, 14, 15 and demanded to tell you what had happened to me. And there's just no way, you know, the, the terror was that deep. And it, it goes to, um, so when she said that to me, and that was 1987, it instantly registered um, as the truth of the experience. And um, that part of the experience, I think for boys and men is, is kind of, that's the common thread and it's unchanging where, the the sense of um, the shame and the terror and the um, feeling of being complicit is so immediate from the get go uh, that it is very tough for anyone from outside to um, break into that. And of course, there is there's a a couple scenes in the book and one in particular where my cousin David, who is probably the person I was closest to in the world is doing everything possible to try to crack my armor and, and get me to tell him what happened that summer. Cause we were at camp together and there was nothing doing. I remember that moment very clearly that my life depended on keeping this secret, even though I didn't understand what it was the secret, but I knew my life depended on keeping it. And, you know, every guy I know has been through some version of that. And, um, you know, today you were just describing the um, Children's Justice Center. So like, that's the dream team. I mean, in my psyche, that didn't exist in the 1960s or 70s or probably 80s, right? I mean, when did Children's Advocacy centers start? I think the first one, oh, I just looked this up too. Um, it, the first one was in Alabama and I want to say 78. Wow. Amazing. So the yeah. year I, the year I just described this scene and, you know, of course they didn't, they didn't start spreading across America till much after that. And in the absence of a children's advocacy center, and for those of you who don't know, it's really um, all the services an abused kid or um, a suspected abused kid, everything that child needs under one roof. So that as opposed to the past where um, a, a child who's abused or suspected of being abused has to go through endless interviews with one law enforcement official after another um, and struggles to find mental health support, um, and you know, legal representation, this is all now um, all in one place in, in a children's advocacy center, and there's over 900 of them. So that, there was nothing like that in my day, even if there was, um, I wasn't gonna get anywhere near it unless someone dragged me there, you know, if someone had found out. But um, today there's much more chance that suspicions will get raised and kids, can get help, which is so crucially important to intervene early uh, because um, you know, the impacts are lifelong and either way, you're gonna be dealing with them for a lifetime, but intervening early is absolutely crucial to chances of recovery uh, and getting back on track, you know? Yeah, yeah, agreed, absolutely. Um, I'm going to shift gears just a bit. Mm -hmm. Another another really striking part or, or thought I had um, from that passage that you read um, was, 
I, you know, I, I wish it, it, I wish it, it was crazy to me, but in my line of work, it's not, but you know, you've got these two guys who have, um, worked at the camp for a long time, you know, presumably our, our trusted employees, they know what's happening. All they're, they're telling you, there's all these other folks who know what's happening. Um, and, and yet they feel that they won't, you know, they, if they go to the cops that nobody will believe them. Mm-hmm. Um, and indeed when you go to the cops, you know, this, this guy never was never, he was never prosecuted. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I, I can attest that, you know, age organizations, institutions, one of the things that you said to me uh, when we, I think, first talked was that uh, predators and institutions ha- have a shared interest in keeping this swept under the rug. That's right. Yeah. Um, can t- talk more about that. Yeah, well, that's sort of like once you once you look at it and realize it, you're like, oh, duh, right, of course. I mean, their, their interests are aligned. Neither um, abuser or institution wants to be exposed. They have huge disincentives uh, from being exposed. The predator doesn't want to get prosecuted and the institution doesn't want a PR nightmare. And so, uh, you know, generally what happens is that, and, and in my case, in the 80s, there was one version of this that happened. They will um, agree that the abuser is going to stop abusing. Like, oh, yeah, you know, I get it. That's... I see it's a problem. I'm going to stop doing that. Oh, fantastic. Uh, and of course he doesn't. And the next time they have the same conversation all over again, and they, they agreed to this fairy tale all over again, and it keeps happening. And sooner or later, of course, when it becomes, um, it can't be maintained, then generally uh, that person is forced out. And as is said in the trade, they pass the trash, you know, they move on to the next institution. That's a huge question that rises out of my book is how did it happen that a serial predator moved from camp to camp to camp to camp, uh, all run by exemplary Jewish social service agencies? What was happening behind the scenes? I'm just a memoirist. Uh, this is my first person experience. I'm not an investigative reporter. That story remains to be written, really. You know, was this a Catholic church deal where all was known and, and uh, this abuser got passed on um, like a package um, or not? If at a minimum, um, there was silence and enabling. And it starts right back at the scene I just read because there are, it is in almost no one's interest, or to put it another way, everyone in organizations, unless you have really stringent child protection safeguards in place, and employees are really well trained and rewarded for reporting abuse, uh, and the rules are enforced, um, unless all that's in place, which is unbelievably rare, um, then, everyone is facing disincentive to report. So in this case, what we see is like a perfect example of employees, high up employees, two of them, as you said, two of the most veteran senior people in the camp um, who, you know, my take is basically scared of challenging the power and scared of losing their jobs. I mean, this is their boss, right? Then you've got, uh, you know, layers of um, administration for reasons I just said before, you know, that have aligned interests. It's almost inconceivable in most of these situations that the administration and the institutions running camps don't know what's going on, if only because camps, as anyone who has gone to them, and most youth serving organizations are gossip mills. It's almost impossible to keep a secret. So if, like in this case, you've got six or seven employees who know, you can pretty well depend on the fact that everyone knows or everyone has heard some version of some story. Um, and, you know, the fact is it's, um, one of the things, one of the reasons I wanted to write this book was 
not just to convey the experience, first person experience of the kid, but really to get at how predators are protected by human nature. And the human nature here is the fact that it's very hard to challenge power. Most, um, most serial sexual abusers in institutions, this is nothing like stranger danger that we were all warned about, right, for decades. This is the opposite. Normally, a charismatic, popular, professional, top of their field, the last person you would suspect, and they hide inside an institution and turn it to their purposes. And you know they come pre-approved, right? Everyone has entrusted their children to them because they've been hired by the experts and those who should know, right? And so in, in a sense, the entire community, parents, employees, everyone is pre-groomed. <laughs> we all, we all love this person. So who's gonna stand up and say, uh, wait a second, something's wrong here. You know, my radar is going off, I've got a hunch. Well, are you gonna trust your gut and blow the whistle uh, and essentially tell an entire community, whether it's a camp, you know, or a church or scouts or, you know, a gymnastics club that this revered person who everyone thinks is God's gift is in fact a con artist and charlatan and sex criminal. That's, that's a pretty scary charge to raise because if you're an employee, you risk losing your job. If you're a parent or other member of the community and something doesn't quite smell right, it's just so much easier to say, ah, oh, no, that's not possible. You know, instead of risking ostracism or worse. And this is what we see over and over and over in every community, no community is spared. And it's the same dynamic over and over, you know, because this is human nature. That, you know, and you know, what I like to say about this is that there's the, in the equation of institutional sexual abuse, the constant is the abuser. There's always going to be a certain percentage of child sex abusers in the population. Been there forever, gonna be there forever. The variable is how we respond. And so far we haven't done a very good job. I mean, we can talk about that and things have changed culturally, things have changed somewhat, but there is still a real challenge in getting institutions that serve youth to make this a priority because it is just, they see it as raising a negative with parents who are their customers. And so they pay lip service and shunt it to the side. Yeah, and you know, I, I... I should know better, but you know, reading that that section, I thought, okay, like <laughs> maybe I, I I thought this was a a work of fiction because I thought, oh, you, they're going to get them now. Um, well, I know you go to you have situations all the time absolutely. in your line of work where you're yeah, trying yeah. you're going to institutions. What do you find? I I mean, I find that institutions don't uh, don't want it to go public. Um, so give give us an example. Don't name any names, but I'm curious. This is 2022. Tell us what. The yeah. Is. So I mean, it's a it's a common scenario, and I won't name any names. But when we have what we would call a multi-victim case, right? So a case where uh, a teacher, a coach, a paraeducator, uh, uh, somebody at a camp, somebody working in a religious agency, somebody in a daycare, somebody in an after-school program, um, and there's allegations of abuse. Um, it's always the potential for a multi-victim case, right? Because it's pretty mm -hmm. rare that if you have somebody in one of these you know, positions of power or, or taking care of kids, you know, there's a good chance that there's not just one victim. So we'll commonly ask that the agency or the institution, the organization sends out a letter um, to families to say right. this has happened and here's what, you know, ho hopefully the, their employment has been terminated and, um, they've been charged or they're under investigation, just kind of the facts of the case mm -hmm. um, to let them know. Uh, and hopefully the, the idea here is not only is that just best practice to let your the families that you work with know, but that if other victims are out there that they might come forward 
Sure. Um, and it's really hard to get people, agencies to, to get that letter out. I mean, we really have to fight them on it. And the lawyers yeah. come in and mm -hmm. there are these kind of tense conversations. And, um, you know, I always walk in thinking that the, the agency is going to just do the right thing. And time and time again, I've got a whole folder of them. Of these, like, well, that, that's just like so damning, now. right? Because here we are 50 years after this happened to me. And this is still the nature so often of the time that 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 kids come last. Everyone else, you know, adults have ways of exerting their power and their interests in a situation, very often yeah. self-interest. And institutions circle the wagons. That's what institutions do. You know, yeah. the first response, you know, every time this comes up in an institution, I don't care what it is, something comes out, there's an allegation, you've got a choice. You can drop everything and try to find out the truth or you can circle the wagons and try to make it go away. I, I don't think I've ever seen the former done. It's almost always the latter until an institution is compelled by a CAC like yours or directly by law enforcement uh, to do the right thing. And that's, you know, that's what we're up against. And there, there are ways to do, I don't know if I should jump into that or I just very quickly say there actually are, um, just so that, I, you know, I don't want to bum everyone out on this front. Yeah. In fact, um, uh, Child USA, which is the leading think tank on this issue uh, in representing children's civil rights and for whom I serve as an ambassador, actually, last year, they did something pretty remarkable because people ask me all the time, well, um, the, I actually just, this came up a lot today because I just, uh, the, the Pittsburgh Tribune published an op-ed by me today. And this question happens, well, I mean, don't all these youth organizations have child protection measures in place? And I say, yeah, but these are not based on evidence and they almost never work. So Child USA did something incredible last year. They conducted a comprehensive study of thousands of cases of child sexual abuse. Um, they, all of the cases from all the Catholic archdioceses, all of the scouting cases, the gymnast case. So they surveyed thousands and thousands of victims and scores of institutions to find out exactly what had happened how the predators had operated and why the standards fail because each one of those institutions had so-called child protection <laughs> measures in place and they failed, why? Once they did that, then they built a set of best practices that could actually work. And, um, and we can talk about it more, but I don't want to get off too far on that tangent, but basically these are not just evidence-based but they're enforceable and the way that they're gonna get enforced, and I think this is brilliant, is by the insurance companies, because the insurance companies are the ones left holding the bag at the end of the day, and it's their, in their interest to make um, their policyholders um, put these measures in place and enforce them and have the underwriting depend on it. So when that happens, and this is already starting to happen, by, by the way, there's a few leading insurers who are starting to do this, then the institution sits up and pays attention because they don't want to lose their insurance, right? Um, and um, then it becomes an organizational priority. So then they do adequate background screening. Then they make employee training a priority then they reward whistleblowers instead of punishing them or forcing them out or discouraging them or ignoring them. And then they report to law enforcement properly, right? So all these things are, these are all ways of, um, and really common sense ways when you think about it, of getting at this um, the resistance of human nature and institutional nature that's built in that we were talking about. Yeah, absolutely. I, I will say uh, in that vein that one of our 
part, again, I won't name names, but you know, when I do see uh, institutions or organizations responding well, it's because they have a policy in place. Uh, like I'm thinking of one school district in particular who has a point person who handles any kinds of yeah, abuse really. allegations. They, they know what they're doing. They've done it before. Um, it, it's not really left up to will we or will we not notify families. It's just that's what their policy is. It happens every time. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, yeah, I, I have having those very clear policies in place ahead of time Right. Um, and evidence-based hopefully um is it, it really shows when you know you look at a dozen of these cases a week yeah right um i had another question it just totally escaped my <laughs> brain um oh i remember another yeah. thing i i've heard you talk about before is um holding institutions um, who allow predators to to stay around and they pass the trash around uh, accountable in the uh, civil courts. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about the the importance of of that path for survivors as well? Yeah, and that's exactly what um, my ed, op-ed piece today was about. And we should probably drop that in the chat or something. But if, if you want to see there. that, you can go to um, Tribune Live. Yeah, Karen Tribune. dropped it in. It's in oh, there. Tribune Live in Pittsburgh. And and the reason um, I wrote that and they published it is that there is a legislative fight brewing in Pennsylvania, which is quite typical nationally right now. Um, and that's over statutes of limitations. Um, and whoop, we have a feline malfunction. Um, statutes of limitations uh, for sex crimes against children are very common in all but a few states that have reformed them. And they're, they're absolutely horrific because essentially they protect predators, not the child or the survivor. Um, so uh, generally statutes, meaning uh, if the crime happened more than five years ago or seven years ago or whatever the statute is criminally or civilly in, in um, that state, once that time is up, you're no longer able to prosecute that person or file a civil case against that person or the institutions that employed um, that abuser. Now, in civil court, you know the reason this is so crucial um, and is utmost importance is that the average age of disclosure for a survivor is 52 years old, right? That's, I mean, to me, that makes total sense <laughs> being a survivor and ask any survival, they'll tell you the same, but most people say, like, what, what happened between, you know, eight or 10 or 12 or 13 and 52? Well, what happened is you're just locked down in your trauma and the, the notion of going to the authorities, much less going to court is just not thinkable or overwhelming. And that's what my op-ed piece is about, what it takes. Specifically, a lot of states like New York, where I filed last year, have not only lengthened um, the statute to, in New York's case, 55 years old, but they opened what's called a look back window so that uh, no matter, during a certain period of time, in New York, it was two years, there was kind of an amnesty where no matter how old you are, no matter how long ago your abuse occurred, you could file suit against your abuser or the institutions um, that held them accountable. And um, more than 10,000 people took advantage of that in New York to file suit. I was one of them. Um, Pennsylvania is now uh, debating uh, the same uh, look back window, which is urgently needed there. Um, As many of you know, or probably know, um, there's been, Pennsylvania was one of the first states to do a really comprehensive study of uh, the sexual abuse by priests and named 1400 predator priests in that state alone. And there's been a lot of resistance from the church to opening a look back window for obvious reasons, because people are going to want and deserve justice. So, um, 
I, you know, for me, um, my case, uh, which by the way, is against UJA Federation, which owned Camp Elifos um, in the 1960s, 70s, early 80s, and the YMHA of the Bronx, which ran the camp, um, they have to be held accountable because I really believe that unless they're forced to pay attention and figure out what happened in the past, then they are not equipped to look at what's happening this summer. Um, and I want to open their files, see who knew what and when they knew it, and uh, reconstruct what actually happened. Because you know, if you can't do it historically, how are you going to do it in the present tense? You know, that would just send a terrible message to parents and kids who are in camps this year. And in my mind, it's the only way to move toward tougher standards, like the gold standard, to focus the attention of these institutions. And almost always, their attention is not focused until they're in court. That's just the reality of it. So. Yeah, that's, um, and I know, you know, going to court's not for everyone. It ain't easy. Honestly, I'm in my 60s. I didn't get my shit together to decide to do it until, um, well, two years ago, but I waited to file till last year for various technical reasons. Um, but it's, it's not an easy thing to do, but, you know, it's, I think it's, if you want to do it, it's hugely important. Okay, um, I think we are gonna move into Q and A, but I have one last question for you. I didn't tell you I was gonna ask you this question. Oh, goody. Um, so I'm gonna spring it on you. But through all, I mean, from coming forward in your twenties to trying to get this guy prosecuted to civil suit, to tracking down other survivors and now writing uh, and publishing this book, what are you, which, you know, as, as a survivor, particularly a male survivor, has, I imagine, taken an enormous superhuman amount of courage. What are you most proud of? Hmm. Um, I'm just, you know, I don't, it's hard for me to, I love how your dog and my cat are both on screen. That's so awesome. Um, You know, pride takes a certain amount of like um, credit. And as weird as this sounds is, I don't take any credit for this. I just feel like if I had known when I started this process of writing the book, what it was going to mean and invite and happen just emotionally, psychologically, much less it being published, I, my head would have exploded. I wouldn't have, I couldn't have started, right? So it happened step by step, step by step. I had some kind of faith and it just was something that had to happen and come out of me. You know, it was just my experience and nature at work, you know, but to, I don't want to dodge the question. I guess I'm just, I, I feel so great that um, it may help kids right now, you know, that, if it somehow makes it easier for kids this summer, that'll be awesome. It will, it will. Okay, um, uh, we've got one question in the Q and A. Uh, folks, now if you, is, your, is your chance, if we wanna jump in the Q and A or the chat, um, we'll get to those. Um, First question I see here is, could you talk a bit more about the book and the process of writing it? Mm, yeah. Um, so I first, you know, it's funny, Noreen referenced uh, the FBI agent Greenlee back in 1987, who said, <laughs> boys who are abused are tougher to crack than murderers. And um, the other thing she said to me was, when it was clear that the FBI out of the Pittsburgh Bureau wasn't going to investigate and prosecute, my abuser, she said, Stephen, you need to write about this. You're a writer, write it. 
people need to know about this. So, you know, I took that to heart. This isn't in the book, by the way. Um, I tried and tried and tried and tried. And um, so, you know, over the years, I just kept hitting roadblocks and I peeled back one layer and try and, but I, I wasn't emotionally capable really of accessing what I had to access. And, and part of it is, and this is not uncommon, you know, you get stuck in certain phases. And in my thirties, it was, the phase was rage. And, you know, when you're stuck in that phase, <laughs> you're not going to get, you're not able to really access what's below the rage. And for most survivors, I know for most guys I know who are sexually abused beneath the terror and the anger, there's a deep connection to the abuser because that's what comes first. That's what grooming is. It's building a relationship of trust and sometimes even love. Um, I don't mean romantic love. I mean, fatherly love, right? And if you can't access that, you're not really going to get at the wounds that are there because that's the core betrayal. It took me a long time to get to that. And honestly, um, I, you know, for a long time in our uh, household, and my wife is here watching, um, we, you know, this was, we, we referred to writing about this as the W, meaning writing, you know, it was just like this cursed thing, you know, or the fucking book, because it was just too big. And it was clear, I couldn't really move through the whole thing. And honestly, by say, I don't know, mid, 20 teens, I had kind of given up, which really uh, was um, caused me a lot of pain. And then 2018, a lot of things happened. Uh, one of them was the Me Too movement, which was truly inspiring. Um, another thing that happened was um, Juno Diaz, God bless him, who published that piece in the New Yorker about his uh, childhood rape um, called The Legacy of childhood trauma. And if you haven't read it, read it. It's astounding and beautiful. Um, and, you know, I got calls from friends, writer friends who said, we need <laughs> more stories from men. So you got to do this. And um, sorry, getting a little emotional here. Uh, I started better prepared from various modes of therapy over the year by a lot of meditation, a lot of silent meditation retreats that had created spaciousness around the trauma and an ability to go there, you know, without imploding or exploding. And um, I suddenly had the opposite experience. The I was not only not blocked, but it was like, Someone had turned on a faucet and I couldn't turn it off. And, um, you know, I wrote a manuscript that's twice as long as the book that you're looking at now. Um, and it just happened. So I don't think there's any lesson or instruction or, <laughs> or guidance in there for writing, except when it's ready to happen, it's going to happen. not seeing there's a lot of great uh comments in here Henrietta I I your comment about uh kids who have experienced trauma needing services or otherwise they're they're just considered bad kids that particularly hits home for me um but oh, I just wanted to read one other thing you put and now I lost it chat box is filling up quickly Oh, uh, Henry just said, I don't have a question, but I wanted to thank Stephen for being such a fine writer. His description of how he felt when he was doing things like shoplifting really helped me understand my own adopted child who went through a similar type of breakdown in adolescence. Um, thank you, Henrietta, for being a foster parent. Goodness knows we need more of you. Yeah. Other questions, folks? Rick and Karen, are, am I missing any questions in this chat that I haven't been following it closely until now? Uh, here's a question for you. How is your book being received so far? I know it's been a crazy week for you. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, it's all of three days, but fantastically. And by the way, I want to give a shout out to Karen at, at Elliott Bay Book Company, because who's on point for author events. She was one of the first online Twitter supporters of my book and um, eternally indebted. Um, and there have been a lot more since, but that was super helpful. Uh, and um, I, it's been a bit overwhelming. I mean, unbelievable support uh, from child protection groups. I mean, you name the group, they've been just, wow. It, it's so, for them and their clients and their supporters and, and children's advocacy centers like yours, it's need to read. It's not like, oh, maybe, or, oh my God, this is too scary. Right. Uh, these, this is what you do for a living. So it's a need to read kind of account. And then there's just um, fantastic support in the literary world um, from fellow survivors. I got a call this morning from a victim from Camp Elifos, um, who I'd never spoken to. Um, and I suspect there will be many more. Uh, and that's part of the unfolding, you know, when the truth comes out, uh, the truth um, reaches people and prompts them to do what has to be done, you know, and I really believe that's what, you know, is happening right now. I mean, one, one crazy thing that happened, I just want to share this, um, and just happened in, in the past week is that, um, I connected with uh, a guy named Jim Clemente, ex-FBI special agent, part of the task force that Faye Greenlee was on that, that you mentioned before from the book. And you wouldn't know him, except you probably do know him, because after the FBI, he became the writer and producer of Criminal Minds, which is the longest running true crime series, you know, on, on television. And um, I was trying to reach him for a long time because people told me he was a survivor and that I needed to talk to him. Um, but I didn't do it. Then someone found his street address here in LA and gave it to me. And I literally left a copy of Chosen on his doorstep. I didn't run, you know, ring the doorbell and run, but pretty close. Two days later, he called me and he said, I'm halfway through, we got to talk. And we met in a bar in LA and talked for five hours. And it was super intense because not only were our experiences of sexual abuse as kids eerily similar, they unfolded at the same time in the same place in New York, not the same camp, different camp, both abused by camp directors. Um, both went to the FBI in 1985. Uh, and Jim was um, worked with the FBI in New York. They put a wire on him. He trapped his perpetrator and they busted him um, and then recruited him into the FBI. That's how he entered the FBI. My case was referred out to the Pittsburgh field office where you'll have to read the end of the book to find out what happened, but it was not the Jim Clemente ending. And um, uh, he's a remarkable person and it was a remarkable meeting. I mean, just speaking of what has happened over the past few days, because um, we had so much uh, to talk about and share and you know to support each other. And He's got a, an amazing podcast called um, uh, Best Case, Worst Case. And he had me on it this week. And the first episode dropped today. I really encourage you to listen to it. Uh, Best Case, Worst Case. It's on all the podcast platforms. Second episode will be next Friday. I've never heard anything like it, uh, honestly because he's so experienced from the law enforcement side, but also as a survivor. And uh, it's, we really break some new ground at getting at the experience and the failures of law enforcement 
uh, and what's happening today, right now that you're looking at every day, you know, and how to grapple with it. So anyway, yeah, amazing stuff. Yeah, that when you told me that story the other day, it just it it so highlights to me, you know, uh, a path that diverges in the woods, right? That he reported and you reported, and the system's response had such wildly different implications, not only for the reporting survivor but all of the others, right? That the the guy in New York, you know, presumably never abused another child again. We can hope, or or at least, yeah. you know. Well, whereas Farinella went on to. Yeah. And, you know, it's like Susan, my wife and I were sitting around the other night. I mean, the night after we, I was talking to Jim and saying, oh, my God, you know, 35 years later, we find out that, oh, my, if we had just been referred that way instead of that way. Right. You know, outcome totally different. And right. that that whole um phase of this story which you can read about in part three and i hope you do uh, talk about re-traumatizing i mean for me that was like round three because i'd already tried to confront the perpetrator in the late 70s at camp henry horner after that scene that i read to you there's another scene about me confronting him which was kind of mind-blowing but here we are eight years later and going to law enforcement and you know getting swallowed up by the system and uh, that was, it was like howling into the wind. I mean, how can you, how, how could it be that we were trying to report a clear case of serial criminality and everyone from law enforcement to the institution to everyone involved seemed to have reasons for looking the other way? Yeah. Yeah, it was, that, that was a painful, but, you know, that too is part of, somehow for some reason that path led me to this and this book so you know i just got to believe that this is my outcome so it's the best outcome and you know the book is the best outcome from this story yeah we have a term for that it's called re-victimization <laughs> yeah there you um, go Okay, there's one more question that I just saw here. Uh, what is your advice to both of us when our friends and family members and others open up to us about being survivors of sexual abuse? You start, I'll jump in. <laughs> um, I believe you. Those, those are the three most important words in the English language for a survivor and and just and then uh, honestly there's no need for any other words the 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 wisdom is to just be present with whatever they are ready to share just be witness to it and in some ways the less said the better except to affirm whatever is being shared with you uh, and that's that's an amazing gift to someone because disclosing is unbelievably hard uh, at no matter what age. For some people, it's 70s or 80s. There's a lot of people like that who filed suit last year in New York who never disclosed. And some of them are, are Jane and John Doe's who still haven't disclosed. So when someone comes to you and shares that uh, just to express complete 100% belief in their experience and to receive whatever they're sharing. Yeah, I'll second that. I believe you, I hear you, is uh, you're 90% of the way there, if if that's your response. Um, I think it's also important to, to um, give that survivor as much choice and agency in what happens next as possible. Uh, granted, you know, there's, Right. Maybe if you're a teacher or something, you've got mandatory reporting um, to deal with. But so much of what sexual abuse, sexual assault is, is taking away people's power and choice and agency. And so anything that we can do to restore that for survivors from the jump, from that first you know, whisper of a disclosure is really important. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'll say is, 
to um, educate yourself, read up on on what um, trauma looks like and what disclosures look like. And it, you, not every survivor is is going to be, you know, uh, crying while they tell you and and you know running away from their abuser. Trauma does very strange things to people. Um, you know, it, not strange if you understand trauma, but strange if if you expect every survivor to to you know run the other direction from their abuser you know like Stephen was saying you know you went to work for this guy right trauma bonding is real it's it's a strong force and um wow trauma bonding I don't, that's a new one to me Noreen thank you that's a great term yeah that yes Stockholm syndrome from a bonding same same thing uh, mm -hmm. in the the trafficking world where a lot of my work is it's it's a very real deal mm -hmm. um but yeah, I mean, just uh, understand that what a uh, sexual assault survivor looks like on TV is not how people look in real life. People shut down. They'll 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 laugh about it. They people have all sorts of different reactions. Um, so yeah, do do your homework on on um, trauma and the effects of trauma on children in particular, if that's who you're you're working with. But I believe you, you're, like I said, you're 90% of the way there if, if you just start with that. Okay, other questions. I don't see any. There's a million great comments in here. Stephen, you should definitely read through here. It looks like an old friend of yours. <laughs> I it, just saw that. In here. <laughs> um, unless Rick or Karen, please speak up if I'm missing any questions, but I think we've gotten to them all. I, I've, yeah, I've looked at it. No, there's nothing else. Just the great comments, as you said, and, and the meeting, wanting to meet Stephen for lunch, uh, my old friend. <laughs> yeah, All that's right. super. So, um, is anything else you, either of you would like to say as we conclude? If, I think because I think we're at that point. You know what? The, the only thing I wanted to um, mention is there are some great resources on my website. Um, I, I mean, I think uh, Karen has probably dropped some resources in the chat about Seattle-based resources. Um, my website, which is stephenmillsauthor.com. Um, I really worked hard to put together a resources page um, that covers the important topics and offers up sort of the best of what each organization in the field does um, so that it's it's easy to find things, which isn't you know traditionally hasn't been the case. Um, so please make use of that if you've got questions or want to research something or need a hotline, uh, whatever it is. Um, and uh, that would be fantastic. Oh, and one other thing too, while I'm on that topic, there's also a take action page. Uh, on the website. So if you want to learn more about the gold standard, which I talked about earlier, you'll find a link to Child USA's gold standard uh, on the take action page. There's also a link to uh, take action in your state on reforming statutes of limitations that we talked about earlier. And actually Child Advocacy USA just launched um, this platform two days ago that I'm linking to there on my take action page. And it's it's amazing because no group has done this before. You just go to their landing page, click on your state, and you can send a message to your state legislators about what's ever active or needed uh, to give victims more access to the courts. Uh, so I hope you'll do that. It's super helpful at the state level. And that goes back to the discussion earlier about what's going on in Pennsylvania right now, but that's just one of dozens and dozens where that's playing out. So thanks in advance, if you can do that. And Noreen, anything else? Nothing else for me except to just echo, thank you, Stephen, so much for your story and your, your book and your advocacy. Um, it's really an important story to be told. Thank you, Noreen. I love what you and your colleagues are doing, learning from you all the time. And I look forward to uh, more conversations. And thank you, Elliot Bay, for having us. Our, our 
our uh, pleasure is not the right word, but uh, uh, we're so grateful to be able to be helping get word of your book and word from you out. Both of you in your own ways are doing um, such necessary and vital work and to hear both of you has been something. And, and Noreen was saying part of what we can do is to read. And I think there's a few things, one place to really start reading is Stephen's book, Chosen, um, which you're, you've heard from some tonight, but there's a lot more to it and, and so much in the writing of the experiences he's gone through through life um, uh, to, to, to get to where we are now. Um, I do want to thank um, Reva, his editor has been here, um, who's keeping late hours and it's back in New York. Oh, really? Okay. She, she's here with us. Um, the woman who also worked with you to make bring this book um, Reva Huckerman um, to in, into the, into being um, because it's um, for everyone I'm sure involved. It that has been something, but um, that you st stuck with it and the description of that. Was... Well, I, you know, I got to say it's this this book has Reva all over it. I mean, it was. I mean, seriously, she, as I've said often, she is the editor every author dreams of. I mean, she was just. Um, I, I don't know. It just seemed to me from the get go, she just completely understood what the book was about. We, and we were, we were, yeah, made we were it what it could be. Before we made it what it could be. Yeah. And, and, but it's then, true. We were tight. I'm not just saying this for public consumption. I was saying this privately before. Uh, true. But, about her yeah. being the world's greatest editor. Yeah. Um, thank you again, everyone, and um, for the comments. And I know. Stephen, good luck with everything as as you continue to live the life of this book, because you said you've been hearing starting this book is just a few days in the world, and you will be hearing from people. And I think when you do these programs in person, we've seen books with somewhat similar kind of areas they cover. And afterwards, the people coming up to you quietly, but then telling you all these stories and, and, and that sometimes they can say them in the room. Um, and that has its own power, but some of them need to come up and do it more privately. And you'll be given a lot of that. There'll be a lot to, to carry, but I know, you know, the, the book is is so helpful that way and such a great service to everyone um, for what you do. And Thank you, Rick. Thanks. Thank you again, Noreen, and thanks for the work you're doing and, um, you know, just all, all both of you so much. Um, and again, thanks. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Stephen was totally right about Karen and what she does with us in, at the LA Bay and and talk about books and book and their places in people's lives and what they talk about. So thank you. Good night, everyone. Um, take care and um, take care of each other and um, read Stephen's book. <laughs>